Hey guys. Alright, Mike Lane here at Wired Grits Bonsai. Uh, thanks again for joining us today for the Zoom meeting. Um, as Mike just said, we're going to be kind of closing out or at least reiterating a program that started about a year and a half ago um, that I titled Health Development and Refinement. Uh, it's basically just a process or a, uh, a formula to kind of take our trees in an efficient manner um, through first getting them healthy, then a development period, and finally through refinement. Uh, the reason why this is so important is that oftentimes as an educator, as somebody who's teaching bonsai, I see a lot of people referring to techniques that they've heard from one artist and techniques they've heard from another, and oftentimes, now that I've been doing this long enough, I can see where the confusion is. A lot of times people are trying to take refinement techniques and apply it to a tree that they're still trying to develop, and likewise try and apply development techniques to a tree that's in refinement. So by knowing where each technique applies, uh, that'll kind of save us some time and hopefully build us quicker trees, okay? Um, so we are doing a, a live Zoom, or a, rather a live feed, so if you guys want to ask any questions, we will stop and answer them as we go. Um, but I'm first going to kind of go through the trees that we started last year, kind of talk about the journey they've taken, uh, and then we'll move on and, and continue to talk about this, this uh, method, okay? So the first tree here is a Molina, or also known commonly as a Parrot's Beak. So this tree was, um, and we'll post some, some pre-pictures afterwards, probably to the feed, uh, but this tree was started, we basically cut everything off of this tree. I think I kept a stub back here to build branches off of, and then trunk chop it at the top here. Um, the first year was largely spent kind of growing proportions, uh, growing thickness to the initial part of the branch, getting initial divides, uh, so basically, kind of like what you're seeing here, the first thing I did was run branches, okay? Get branches where I need them to the left, right, back of the design, and the lowest branches on the, the design, I've just been increasing in size, increasing in size. Uh, I have pruned them. You can see I've pruned them very close to the design a few different times to get division. And what I personally look for as an artist is what's called bifurcation. And so what that means is each time I prune, I'm trying to prune to the furthest two branches back on the, the branch. So I'm always looking to go from one branch to two, two to four, four to eight, eight to 16, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of been the process through development. I usually don't really think about refinement until I've gotten my primaries, secondaries, and then maybe the tertiaries developed well. Uh, and that's when I'll start thinking of moving a tree onward to refine it. So these trees are pretty close um, to where I would start to refine them, and I even have started to do some of the refinement work. Uh, one thing I did want to say is that a year is not necessarily always long enough for a development cycle. Some <coughs> wounds are going to be, if you make a four inch wound on a trunk, you're not going to heal that in one year realistically. So uh, the size of the tree and the problems that you face all kind of dictate the development cycle. Um, things that we're supposed to accomplish also in development is all your heavy lifting. So any wounds that are on the trunk, is it gonna be easier to heal a wound when a tree is in a tight little pot with no room to grow roots, with branches that are pruned constantly, or is it gonna be easier to heal a wound when you've got branches running four feet? Uh, it's usually going to be much, much easier, much, much quicker to heal it when your branches are growing very, very long, very vigorously. So that's a good example of development techniques being mixed with refinement techniques. Okay? So this Molina, going forward, what I'm trying to do is we still have a difference in size on my first division here. So I'm going from one to two here, and one is much, much larger than the other. And in a sympodial growth pattern, which we'll talk about in a little, a little later, uh, we do want to kind of keep the division somewhat equal. So that one to two should be kind of an even split. We shouldn't have one necessarily always stronger and one super weak, okay? Do we have a question? Um, we have uh, an audio issue. We're a okay. little low, so I'm gonna try to move it a little right. closer to you. No worries. And let's just move this. All right, continue, Testing. let's see. Testing. Is this better, uh, Catherine or Clint? Is this well, better, Catherine? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, 
I'm going to keep on talking so you guys can hopefully uh, hear what I'm saying. Uh, so what I was just talking about was when to divide the branches and how I'm looking to divide those branches. Um, it's easiest to try and think of it as an even divide. As you get more advanced, you can kind of play with letting one grow longer and one grow weaker. But nine out of ten times, I'm looking to divide that branch evenly by two. Okay? So I'll even draw that out just so you guys can see that concept. So if I grow and I chop my tree here, I'm usually going to get some buds somewhere on the tree. So the next thing that happens is I usually get buds like that. I get branches that usually emerge. So the next thing I'll do is kind of clean the wound back to those branches. Like that. So I clean it back to that. Now that's set me up. I, whether I'm doing this on a trunk or a branch, that's now set me up to heal this wound perfectly. Because now I have a, a branch growing on one side of the wound and a branch growing on the other side of the wound. And that means that as these elongate, now that I've cleaned that, they will seal that wound. Okay? And so that will create a, a convincing physiology, a convincing taper. So the next move I do is I run those branches out until that wound is healed, covered with scar tissue. And then I cut those. And I repeat the same process. So I cut those, and then those will usually bud out. And again, I clean back to where they bud out, in between those two branches, and I kind of get that kind of structure. So it's a one to two to four to eight, and regardless of whether I'm dealing with branches or trunks, it's kind of the same theory of, I don't prune those next branches until the wound I made is healed. So with that theory, you can kind of start to get your head around why four inch wounds are such an eyesore and why it's such a big deal to do big trunk chops like that, because that means it's years potentially of healing that wound if that's your goal, okay? So with the Premna, or sorry, the Molina, I'm just trying to even out some disparity between thickness and the branches, and then these will be cut, and this should ideally start to be potted into a bonsai pot. So what the bonsai pot does for us, that's a refinement tool. So think, if I'm trying to grow something big and strong, like I was just saying, do I want to constrict the roots, or do I want to give the roots free reign? If I restrict the roots, that then slows the plant down. Also the soil medium, how we choose that, will slow the plant down and that will start to give us finer details. You'll notice as you're going through development that you'll hit a plateau where you can't go any further because the inner nodes grow too long for you to build more details. You're literally cutting off as much as you're growing. And so that's a point where you really need to go to refinement and start with holding fertilizer, start slowing down how you're feeding it with lower nitrogen, uh, potting into a wetter medium that will slow the plant down, uh, letting it get root bound, so basically weakening the tree. So before I move on, I just want to kind of simplify that concept. In this development refinement kind of school of thought, you have two primary tools. You have weak growth and strong growth, and knowing when to use what is really, really important. Don't worry about small leaves if you're trying to grow big branches, because the big branch needs big leaves to kind of fuel that, and you're kind of working against yourself. The small leaves come in refinement, okay? Uh, so we'll move on from this point. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the other trees. Do we have any questions so far? Um, we have better sound right now. All right. Um, you guys are hearing me loud and clear? So far, that's, that's all our feedback. Okay. All right, so we're moving on to one of my favorite species. Um, this is probably one of my two primary passions in bonsai right now. Uh, this is a sea hibiscus. So uh, when we started with this one, we, I bought it, or rather selected it for this program, basically just built on the sheer size of the trunk. I basically thought we were getting the most trunk for the money. Um, but there are flaws to that, that theory and that thinking, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, about why that's kind of not a great idea. Um, I was able to kind of build the tree uh, into kind of a classic form, but there are a lot of flaws that I wasn't able to fix in a year. Uh, one being this large scar here. So this large scar, I should have continued to run a branch from the top for a much longer period to heal both this scar here and this scar to the back. Um, so one of the issues that we had 
when we first potted this tree, it had a, a pretty rough time recovering from that. It took me a while to get it back on track. Uh, and so it didn't quite grow as fast or as robustly as these really can. So I'm gonna kind of pull up another one and we'll talk about why this is important. Okay. So this tree is another one that I've been working on at home. And this illustrates this big pot, big growth kind of theory, all right? Now this guy is only a year old. I took this cutting last year about this time. You guys can go on my Facebook or my Instagram and kind of see when I started posting these little guys. Uh, and what I've been doing is up potting it as it goes. I select, now when I say development, that doesn't mean let everything grow rogue. It doesn't mean just stick it in the ground and ignore it. What it means is checking your growth routinely, selecting what you want, and letting that grow out strong. So as you can see, the first couple things I did on this tree were I wired two primary branches, two divides, and I let it grow out strong, okay? I let it grow out strong on two sides. And so there are zero wounds to this trunk, nothing to heal, nothing to have to worry about until I get up to this point, all right? So this is gonna be already kind of set ahead of this guy where we are not even gonna to have to deal with healing a big wound, okay? And this one is younger than this tree. The next thing I'm gonna be able to do is get proportions much, much faster because I'm in a bigger pot. I'm gonna basically be able to grow this quicker and surpass this. This is gonna be like a tortoise beats the hare kind of thing. This guy got the head start and was a bigger tree than initially, uh, but this guy's gonna overtake him in time and quality and size by just following proper technique, okay? So in six years time, mark my words, unless we put this guy back into development and do some major changes, this guy will have surpassed him by a great deal. So that's why I'm such a big advocate of working with cuttings is that it's a lot easier to um, not make any of those issues than it is to then fix them. So with this guy, I'm not saying that this is a bad tree in any way, it's just a, a talk on efficiency. So this guy, what I should have done and is not worried about refinement for a little while longer. I should have allowed this branch to continue to grow at the top and anything growing from the top. So anything I grow from the top of the tree heals anything beneath it. So if there's any wounds on the scar, if I run a branch from the top, it heals all of those. Um, it can reduce your taper, which is one of the negatives, um, but I'm not a big advocate of running sacrifices off of the trunk lower down because then you have to cut them off and leave another big wound. So usually run a sacrifice from the top, heal these guys, uh, and this would be a much higher quality tree. So it's something we can still do, but we gotta go backwards. So talking about some of the things that I did do with what we had. Um, I did build some good size in proportion to these initial branches. You can see that I made a cut just recently here onto these divides for both taper and division. Um, I also did a few graphs on here. This is actually a grafted branch to put a branch to the back. And then I've got another graft here that I just placed uh, a couple days ago. So I'm hoping that we'll get a new branch back here. Um, this plant, if this was at my house and I really wanted to continue developing, I would up pot it. And the good news is that we put three of these into bonsai soil already. So this is basically a lot of the work on the roots has already been done. So it'd be very, very easy to just continue to up pot it until you get to the desired uh, results that you want, okay? So that's the sea hibiscus. All right, any questions? Um, Clint, can you hear us? Or not me, it doesn't make sense. Clint, Clint, can you hear us? Are we coming in okay? Uh, this unfortunately is as close as we can get to Mike I, without I get, losing the I shot. I can get closer if, if Lindsay backs up. Okay. Um, so Clint, just let us know if you can hear us. I'm going to keep pushing forward. Okay. All right. Did he write back? Andre can hear just fine. Okay, cool. So cool, cool. I think we're good. All right, so our next one is a material that I really, really like to use in bonsai, uh, ficus salicaria. We used to call these ficus neurofolia. Uh, it does appear a little yellow today. I just defoliated it uh, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and it just started coming back, and I was hoping it would just be thin red leaves for you guys today so that we'd really be able to see some of the branches. 
Um, so this is a point where we could actually, if we had more time, really talk about refining this tree. So there's a lot of, I've just kind of been letting it grow. I haven't been hedge pruning it, but I have been letting it grow and uh, every so often dividing the big branches and letting them grow out. So what I should actually be doing on all of these trees at some point uh, is doing a full defoliation this season and going through and eliminating any issues. So I haven't gone in with my, my keen eye looking through the branches and seeing that there's not clusters of three. I should be thinning these down to clusters of two, which is that bifurcation. Um, and anything more than that, I, I don't uh, let it stay on the tree. So that was going to be my next move, one of the reasons I had defoliated it. Um, and we probably will still do that in the future, but we're going to work on this guy today and talk about that so I don't want to spend too, too much time. Um, same kind of story with this guy. We could have spent more time growing branches up to heal wounds, but I did also want to get some of these trees into a level of refinement so we could talk about that as well. I did not want to just talk for two years on development. So I figure this gives us the best kind of bang for our buck and anybody who gets these trees can either keep them as they are and continue to refine them or if they want to fix any of the issues they can always keep them in the big pots and develop. Um, so this one too is also in bonsai soil. It had some major, major, major roots cut and so and all of the circling roots I think are corrected. So that's also a big bonus to this tree is that not only are, have we done the work up the top, that's fine and that's what everybody sees, but really the engine of the tree is here. And if you ignore this, then this means nothing. Because this will have a shelf life if you ignore it for too long and your tree will look great for a year or two, but then it'll start to peter out. Okay? We having an issue? No. Oh. All right. Oh. Um, so it'll start to peter out. So it is a good idea. Honestly, in a perfect world, I'd probably start with the soil on everything. We do have a question. Sure. Um, Fatima did ask, uh, what soil do you use for up potting? Oh, oh, oh. Okay, so we're going to open a can of worms here. I use primarily for when I'm growing something in development, I'll use nursery soil. Okay? Unless I want to, unless it's a piece of material that speaks to me, enough to where I'm like, this is going to be really something special and I need to take care of it now. And in that case, I'll usually put it into our coarse mix here at Weigerts, which is lava, uh, expanded clay, and a little bit of pine bark. And I'll usually use that as my development soil. And what I've been doing in recent years is then putting over to the Alp mix, uh, Akadama lava pumice, or even just Akadama uh, for refined trees, especially, or Shohin rather. And that's been working pretty well. Uh, I was talking earlier with Mike about that and Lynetta, how that has kind of changed my, my watering. Trees that I was watering every day, I'm now watering every three days because they're in that Akadama soil, that very fine, straight Akadama soil. So think of it development, we want to go as coarse as possible. However, there is a trade-off. Like, and you'll see, there's nothing wrong with using organic soil especially if you know it's a tree that's going to handle the bare root fine. Basically what you want to do is you don't want to ignore this for so long that when you go, you have this great tree up top, but when you finally go to deal with this, you got to cut a bunch of big roots and you lose a lot of the tree you grew. So it's a good idea that I'll probably next year, even if I want to continue growing this, I should probably correct some roots in here and then continue to develop it. So I'll probably at that point take this out, put it to bonsai soil in a big pot, which is gonna be expensive, and I'm gonna to continue to grow it. Anything cheaper, anything that doesn't have high, high grade quality that I'm just gonna grow out and see how it turns out, nursery soil. Don't spend the money, okay? The bonsai soil should only be reserved for the things that you really know are gonna kick butt, um, and then the rest of it, you can wait and see and develop it in nursery soil until it kind of deserves that next stage. But always a good idea in a perfect world, and we're all excited to build the tree, but once you learn a little bit about soil science, you'll learn that this will help you build this. Okay, so if we take care of this first, this becomes a lot easier. All right, so we've done the first conversion. So now the good news is, is when we decide to repot this to a small pot, our options are almost limitless. We're not going to have to say, oh, well, it's the first pot and we've just got to go down to a, a similar size pot. We'll be able to do probably two thirds reduction on this pot size and have the tree defined. Okay, so we're, we're in a good place with this bonsai mix. You had a question? Catherine would like to know how do you correct roots? Oh, 
So roots are typically supposed to be positioned around the tree in a radial, radial fashion. Okay, let me get another piece of paper. In an ideal world. Now this isn't every tree. Okay, and this is also one of the problems with teaching bonsai is that words, when I'm teaching these programs, my words can be taken the wrong way. So I was just talking about roots and they need to be radial. That's only for ficus, maples, elms, trees that uh, in Japan are traditionally have those radial roots. Junipers, they don't care. Um, pines, they don't care. So uh, it's important to kind of take everything that you hear and there's always going to be contradictions. Okay. So usually we're always looking for this kind of radial root pattern where there's roots coming all the way around the trunk. But what you'll notice is A, you're gonna have circling roots or B, you're gonna have different size roots. So you'll notice like one of these roots will be really big and then you'll have a lot of little roots. Maybe I'll highlight that a little more. So you might have one big root here and a bunch of little roots. So the way to correct that is at repotting, I would cut this big root and then leave these alone not cut these guys. And so what they'll do is these will gradually catch up to this guy and he'll divide just like a branch. So this root will then push sub roots, little tiny roots, and these guys will thicken to his level. And you continue to re, uh, redo that every time you repop. You look at those roots and you try to address them. So on ficus, one of our biggest issues when we first start with usually a salicaria or even a tiger bark is you have a lot of circling crossing roots. And now you know, I'm not the bonsai police, but traditionally, and if you want to show trees in a Japanese bonsai show, crossing roots are a no no. Okay? So if you're not going to show your trees, then it doesn't matter. But if you do have any aspirations for show, that's considered a flaw and that should be eliminated. Okay? So I hope that, that answered your question pretty good. Um, so before we move on from this guy, this is going to be kind of that sympodial style as well. So we're going to talk, talk a little bit about this at the request of some of the members because we were going to do a whole program on this sympodial style. And what sympodial style is, is more so just a different physiology to how trees grow. And how it applies to our bonsai is all about just the proportions that we're seeing. So it's not really going to change too many of our rules or how we're going to build the tree. It's just in when we decide to make that initial cut in our development and divide the branch. So it's really just proportions. So think of an oak tree, all right? It, it doesn't have a single trunk, typically. It doesn't have downward sweeping branches. And usually when you think of it, it's kind of a one to two to three to four kind of uh, divide of even energy. So it's kind of dividing that energy evenly. I'll kind of draw out the difference here. Okay, just give me a minute. Are there any questions coming in while I'm talking? Catherine said thank you. Thank you, Catherine, you're the best. And this is kind of more like a pure nate than anything, but that's a good sympodial grower. And we'll do a pine tree over here. Okay, so the two terms that you'll hear are monopodial and sympodial. So mono means one, and what monopodial in, a, in simple terms means is usually single trunk, single leader, all right? And now that's kind of a misnomer because you can have double trunks, but what I mean is usually in the difference here, this would be monopodial, and you'll have one trunk that determines uh, or gets most of the energy, it becomes a leader, and everything else are just branches of uh, much, much smaller diameter. So you have this primary trunk here, branches of much, much smaller diameter. So not an even division of energy. And even on these branches, when you look at them, the, the singular branch has a leader that kind of extends out throughout the branch. Um, so that is a monopodial design. It's growing with a leader of one. You, even if you have multiple trunks, they, each one will have a single leader. So think of the divide of energy, okay? Over here, this is one equally dividing to two, equally dividing to four, equally dividing to eight. And so Leonardo da Vinci was actually one of the guys who, um, who noticed this, but if you add together all of these little tertiary branches, they should equal the trunk. If you add together all of these little secondary branches, they should equal the trunk. If you add together these primary branches, they should equal the trunk. So it's an e even division of energy. Okay, that's an easy way to think of it. Um, as you go down the rabbit hole, 
there is another way to think about symphotial growth, and this might get a little bit confusing, but basically when I make my cut, so I'm doing an angled trunk now, when I make my cut like that, this is my bonsai pot, this is my trunk, I'll get my two branches, I'll get my two branches like that, but then I'll prune one of them first, okay? and start that divide. So I prune this guy and I start him dividing, but I don't prune him yet. That gives me a semi-leader, but it's called a sympodial leader. So we're still dividing the energy much differently than a monopodial tree. This one's going up a little bit longer, and then we divide it at a later date. And then we continue that process, allowing one to grow a little longer, and then we divide one sooner. And that gives kind of a staggered sympodial look. So that's how you kind of get those elm trees that you see that are kind of thin and slender that work their way up, okay? So it's still a sympodial versus monopodial growth pattern. So this guy, it's pretty clear to see. He doesn't have one leader going up. We do have a strong trunk here, but also we've got almost equal divide here. So it's hard to determine, is this a one trunk? Is this a two trunk? Is it, are these branches? That's kind of sympodial. It's that even division of energy, okay? So think of it as oak trees versus pine trees. And the reason that's important is that in bonsai today, uh, a lot of people are taking on this more naturalistic approach. And a lot of artists, again, in bonsai shows, are critiquing broadleaf trees designed like pine trees and pine trees designed like broadleaf trees. So I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that that's kind of the bar, that's the convention, and you should be aware of it, okay? So we'll move on from this guy. One more. So plans for this guy is I did defoliate this portion. I did not defoliate this. And you'll see there's weak branches. Like this is a really weak branch. This is not to be touched. This is actually, uh, my whole goal was to run this one branch. I defoliated all of this, left this and this. And this one started coming back pretty vigorously. And this one arguably came back a little bit, but not where I'm happy with it. So what I'll do again is wait till this recovers, and in about another month, I'll defoliate it again. And I'll keep weakening the top. So what defoliation is, is kind of a refinement technique in that it weakens the tree. That takes away strong growth. So anything you defoliate, you're weakening that area, and the tree will push it to a stronger area, push that energy, okay? So we're moving on from this. So this is probably my favorite tree of the bunch. Uh, this is probably my all-time favorite species to work. This is Kremna microphylla. Uh, so this was a really, really fun tree to work on. It was kind of a labor of love. Um, and I'll really, really talk you guys through the process of this. So for those of you who remember, we did do a heavy trunk chop. It took us a few different visits to do this because the first thing we had to do, we started this in February. And so we couldn't really cut it back as hard as we wanted. So we cut it back on a few big branches, waited till the spring, and then cut it back hard, and Mike did the repot. Um, again, it's stressed, we nursed it back to health, and it has thrived in the last year and a half, and it's just done everything I could have hoped it to do. Um, again, though, no, I didn't get the wounds all the way healed. That's half my fault as well. Uh, I didn't clean them appropriately the first time. I should have dug a little bit deeper. So they weren't healing the way I wanted them to, so I had to reopen this wound, and I had to reopen this wound, and that cost me some time. And so again, it's not, this isn't a, a class about right or wrong, this is a class about efficiency. And so all that did, I didn't necessarily do anything wrong, but now that cost me time that really could have been used when I was running these big branches, that's where that fuel to heal that wound was coming from. And you know that would have been really useful to close that wound at a quicker rate. We'd probably be 50% further than we are now if I had made the cut uh, as aggressive as I should initially. So we're moving on from that. Now a few things that we could do here, we've been dividing these branches, we are ready for refinement. We could technically, if this was my tree, uh, I would probably start putting this in a bonsai pot and start slowing it down because I'm already having an issue uh, refining the branches by internodes getting too long. And what I'm doing to refine this tree now is I'm still doing that same one to two, two to four, four to eight, but what you'll see is I'm doing it on a very small scale. So premnos grow opposite. They always grow 
two branches on one side. So wherever you cut, that branch that you just cut back to is going to give you two branches off the tip. So I've literally been going out probably every three days and have been cutting buds, little tiny buds, every single one. Because right now it's growing so quick that the inner nodes extend too fast. And if I let it grow, uh, you cannot use a long inner node in refinement. You'll, whether you cut it today or later, you'll see it like an eyesore later on in the design and you'll have to cut it off later. So don't use extended inner nodes. If they extend, they're useless. So you cut them back to the, the last good inner node and so what I found while I'm still using that heavy fertilizer, I have to be out there every three days cutting back those buds to make sure they don't extend too much. And that's keeping me really, really, really tight. All right? Um, now what that's also gonna do though, is that's gonna net, because I'm not really looking at what I'm cutting, that's gonna grow a lot of problems. So I'm going to need to, if this was gonna stay at my house, I would probably defoliate it this month and then go through the branches and, uh, Go, Mike's laughing. Um, I would go through the branches and uh, make sure that I'm not growing tridents. You know, take out the middle if I need to. If I have any of the petiole left from the last time, or rather the inner node that didn't die back, I'll clean that out to make sure it's an even divide. Because again, if we ignore it and we don't clean it out and we just let a year go by, then that's time we could have been healing that wound that we're going to make when we go and we clean that out. So if we ignore it, then we just miss the opportunity to heal it like that. Okay. So this is why, for a long time, it escaped me why the Japanese approach to bonsai is so regimented and so on a schedule. And now it's starting to dawn on me because you only have a, a certain amount of growing season to get your work done. And so if you're not kind of primed to do your work when you need to do it, then you'll run out of time. So uh, I've started to get a lot more regimented on when I do things, and I'm trying to do them the same time every year. Okay. So what I was thinking going forward in the future with this guy is you have a few different options. This side, I'm not 100% happy with it. I don't hate this kind of divide over here. But what this could even become, because these hold dead wood, is you could technically make this whole half of this tree dead wood and a shari going down the trunk um, and just building off of this side of the tree. That's one interesting aspect that you could do. Or you could just leave it as a whole kind of twin trunk tree. Um, but there's a lot of options with this tree and we did get a lot of wound closure You can see it. I don't know if she can get the camera in there But there's a few little wounds in there that are little belly buttons from our initial cuts that are almost completely closed So we did make great mm -hmm. progress on this guy. He has a great Nabari This tree really has good roots to build a great tree on uh, and this is just going to get better and better and better so this is a tree that you know if Shofu wanted me to keep it I would I wouldn't be opposed if they wanted me to have it forever and to live on my bench. Um, but I think whoever gets this tree, this is really going to be uh, my baby. So enjoy this guy. Um, so this is what we're going to work on today as well is Prima Microphylla. We're going to kind of backtrack a little bit uh, to the beginning of this program and talk about how we set something up for development and how we get to this point. Okay, so remember this is 18 months, I think. We started this in February 2019. So we've really come a long way by just being efficient with our choices uh, and building the tree with a plan. So we're going to try and do that same thing on this tree once we get into that. Uh, I am just going to talk about a few more things, more so on that sympodial style as well. So I'm just going to grab a few more trees. Do we have any questions out there? Um, no. This is a quiet group. Oh, how do you get bigger, larger roots? Terry would like to know. Bigger, larger roots. Now, this is a game I wish you guys were, were here in person because this is a game that I really like to play. It's a Q&A about whether the techniques are going to make something weak or strong. If you want big roots, then you need to big growth. Big growth. So here's a little kernel of truth that hopefully will uh, simplify this and make this concise. As above, so below. So whatever is occurring at the top of the plant is also occurring at the bottom of the plant. So if you're growing a branch thumb size up on the top of the tree, if it reaches that thickness, you're also going to have a root somewhere on that trunk, usually in the same region of the trunk, uh, that's also going to be that big. So coarse growth equals coarse root growth. Okay, fine root growth equals fine growth up here. So as above, so below. They're tied so, they're 100% they're tied together. So think of it that way. 
whatever's occurring at the top is also occurring at the bottom. So if I need to thicken a root, I need it to grow stronger, um, A, I don't prune it on repotting, and then B, I just grow uh, unrestricted growth, or I grow vigorous growth. Does that, does that make sense? Hope it makes sense. Um, Elizabeth says, uh, specific to Premna, how do you approach defoliating? Uh, pinch leaves off, clip them, or what? Any means necessary with the Premna, no. Uh, in a perfect world, you would use scissors because that's the safest method. Uh, and I think that's easy to say on a tree like sea hibiscus, but on a Premna, it's my known to use scissors and to really get every single leaf cut at the petiole. So what I found is uh, I do use my big fat fingers. I try to, at the tips of the branches, use my scissors where it's most delicate. And towards the base of the branch, I use my fingers or tweezers. I use tweezers to pull them up. Uh, but it's not my favorite activity. It's something that uh, I put off for a long time when I first started getting into Premna, but it is essential because something that I didn't touch on is that Premna can lose, or, or rather can uh, die back inner structure very, very easily. So once we build this out to be a very, very dense tree, you can't rest on your laurels. And that's what happens to a lot of people is they build out these great bonsai trees and then that design starts to go south uh, throughout the years. And that can be because they don't have good refinement maintenance. So we spend all this time building this internal structure on this tree, but if we never let it get light, then it's eventually gonna die out. So oftentimes I'll do a one complete defoliation throughout the whole tree, usually at the beginning of the season. So I'll go out April, uh, maybe late April, early May, I'll go out, I'll do a complete defoliation and cut back, okay? Then throughout the season around this time, maybe even a little later. I don't want to get too close to winter, but I want to time it as close as safely possible. I want to do a partial defoliation, basically defoliating the outer shell of the tree and allowing light to the inner structure, okay? That will preserve your inner growth, um, but you have to do it. If you don't do that, and I've seen it on plenty of my premna where you'll start seeing shaded out growth. The growth will get weak and it'll just start dying back. It'll turn yellow, it'll fizzle out and then you'll have to rebuild that in the next year on your next defoliation. So proper maintenance, just trying to get that, those leaves cleared out at least a couple times a year. And you're working that around repots. Like if I repot this, I don't want to then defoliate it two weeks after I repotted it or a month after I repotted it. So it's, bonsai is all about trying to play this balancing act. Okay, you've got all these things you need to do and each one kind of takes a little bit of the energy bar. So, uh, but on a healthy tree, a tree that I'm not repotting, two times a year, I defoliate minimum, just to allow light in. I do not touch it in the winter. If you try to defoliate this in the winter, um, that can be a big, big issue. So the best thing you can do is watch your watering and try and maybe trim big leaves and allow light in that way. But winter's the trickiest time for these guys, keeping the structure, because you, you will get a little bit of dieback each winter um, if you're not very, very careful with your watering and maintenance. Okay. Uh, Catherine wants to know, did you completely defoliate this Premna this spring? I did. Yes, I did. Uh, I completely defoliated it and completely wired it. So now here's the good news, is me personally, on uh, the way I build trees, I'm not saying every artist out there, I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but me personally, and for those who have seen my Premna, and if they like them, know that once I get to this stage, I'm usually done doing full wirings. Um, and maybe in a year or two, I might defoliate it and do some some wiring on some of the details, but really we're, I'm past that point of having to go in there and wire out a ton of structure. And the reason I say that is these branches are of size to where they're not going anywhere. So that's not gonna spring up like this in a year. I'm not gonna have to go rewire my whole structure and bring it all back down. If anything, I might need to just rewire um, areas where I need to fill in, areas that maybe don't have a branch that I need to bring something over, okay? But I'm done doing complete wiring. So now it's all just great. This is where everybody wants to be in bonsai, where you're just pruning it, having a good time. Uh, Terry says, how about taper? Um, not sure I follow. Uh, so yes, taper is very, very important. Uh, I'm not sure if he's asking, are we looking to build taper? Um, Terry, what would you like to know about taper? Terry, is there a little more, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on the, the taper question? I'm happy to get into it. So and when, I'll wait for him to, I'll keep talking until he, he kind of comes back. So what I've been doing on this premium, what I'm looking to do is 
I'm still building out my divides. This branch is kind of, a, I've gotten up to four, I think, tertiary branches or secondary branches, but this one's very, very weak and thin, and so that's the wired one, and that's the one I'm allowing to run out. I'm not pruning that until it gets to the thickness I want. Okay, so that kind of, let's go back one tree, two trees just so I can explain that. So you'll see, like this guy, I just pruned back. And you see how close to my last cut I just I pruned back to? This was my last cut here. And then I allowed this to run, 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 run. And then I just pruned it here to divide it to two. I may even prune it back again if I'm not happy with that internode spacing when it divides. Okay? So that's how I also build tapers. As we're growing and dividing to two, that hopefully this helps Terry. Um, as we're growing out a branch, we grow it big, right? So we get it to thumb thickness, and then when we cut it, we divide it to two. If there's only two branches there, then you'll, you'll only ever increase your taper. Because now you've got 50% thickening on this side, 50% thickening on this side. So you don't have a middleman, you don't have anything thickening the middle, and so you should never blow out that taper in theory. Okay? Um, he, it seems that he's interested in taper to the top, a large trunk uh, taper to the top. Okay, so that's a great question. So if you need to make a big trunk chop, um, the, the time that it takes for you to heal that is how you need to taper that tree. So a good way to think of this is most trees nowadays are structured for a 6 to 1 taper ratio. Meaning that if this tree is 1.5 inches wide at the trunk, so 1.5 inches wide here, that means I can go six times that height. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I could technically still go a little higher and still be within my taper parameter. Um, but what I need to train my eye to look for is where to cut to achieve that uh, six to one. Okay? And you don't have to do six to one. You can do 12 to one. That's what uh, were really popular in the 80s were 12 to one trees. They're much taller, much more elegant, and a lot of people still really like those trees. I just tend to like smaller, chunkier trees, and that six to one tends to give them that, that ratio. Uh, so what I do is once I make a cut, and again, I'm usually working with smaller trees, I then try to run those branches that come out, two of them, as close to the wound as possible. I try to run those out until they're healing that wound, and then I cut them. So think of it as though you're kind of working the wound out to the smallest growth until it's gone. Okay, so it's like you're healing a little bit at a time as you're, as you're pruning and running branches, pruning and running branches. Okay, I hope that helps. All right. Terry says thank you. You're welcome, Terry. All right, so just a few more and then we'll get into the demo. Now, I'm not too worried about the time on the demo because development work is the real development work. We're going to be cutting a lot of this tree back. So hopefully we're not going to have too, 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 too much to wire. Okay. So just kind of talking again about development. So the process, I usually start with to avoid any issues. This is what I've really gotten to love is because I don't like fixing problems. Fixing problems is no fun. Um, I'd rather just move forward all the time. So I've started doing this, okay? Taking cuttings, and the first thing I do is I wire them for shape. So either semi-cascade, informal, however I want to do it. But for Chauvin, 9 out of 10 times it's going to be informal or semi-cascade. So I make a little semi-cascade like that with the wire, and then this is ready to pop to a 1 gallon. So then I would take this and I'd put this to a 1 gallon and let it just blow out. Okay. Then I would take the next size up of wire, I'd take some big wire again, and I'd wrap it again with wire and I'd contort it again, and then move it up to a 3 gallon pot. And I will do that until I get to the size I want. Now this guy, I made, he's at the size I want. I don't want him any bigger. That's why I made my cut here, and I made my cut here, okay? Because this is gonna be either a Kifu or a Shohin tree. So you see, that's another benefit to doing Shohin, is that my development cycle is shorter. This, is a, this was a one year to my first real chop and moving on to design. So with Shohin, your development cycle is a lot smaller than if I want to grow a 20-year tree, a 20-year masterpiece. So, but it's very, very possible by just growing from cuttings and just making sure that you never make a flaw. It'll be the most efficient growth you'll ever do, and you'll notice that in no time, you've got a tree where you're not having to look at it and say, well, how do I fix this, and why did this happen, and 
Why do I have reverse taper here? It's just easier to not let it happen, okay? So remember, tortoise beats the hare. So if we start with the cutting and we never grow flaws, then we'll actually overtake the other tree nine out of 10 times. So that's kind of the process to development to get the most efficiency. Now again, I'm not saying I even follow that rule all the time. I'm just teaching the formula, okay? This is the theory and how you apply it is all on you. You might find that you like to do 50% development and jump right into to refinement and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's knowing where your tools are and what they are and knowing like why you have big leaves at this stage and why you can't get small leaves here. So knowing what you need to accomplish your tasks is all I'm trying to teach. So this is the next thing right here. We so have a question sure. from Catherine. Yeah. Back to cuttings and soil. Okay. Is it better to keep them in nursery soil than bonsai soil with heavy fertilizer? It's easier, easier. Doesn't mean it's better. Um, it, I would rather grow cuttings in bonsai soil and just not have to deal with growing a tree big and having to repot it back into bonsai medium, especially on junipers and pines. I, I hate having to do that. I wish I could just grow them in aggregate soil and just shake it out and move them to the appropriate soil. It saves me a lot of problems. In reality, it's a lot harder to root cuttings in aggregate and I haven't had as much luck keeping them healthy in aggregate. So there's always exceptions. Some do like it, some don't, but nine out of 10 times I do better rooting them in organic and working with them that way until they're strong enough to repot. The other thing I've noticed, and this isn't even a bad thing, we're just impatient. They say oftentimes you'll repot a tree from nursery soil to bonsai soil and it will uh, not do anything for a year. It might sit there and not grow and you'll be like, well, that was a big mistake. Why did I do that? And that's a bridge you're just going to have to cross because he has to acclimate. This specific tree, I potted over to bonsai soil a year ago, um, or sorry, almost two years ago now. And when I did, that whole year was a wash. I got nothing on the top. Okay, nothing. He didn't grow for anything. And then I, I kept him double potted. He still didn't do anything. And finally this year, he woke up and has been growing just magnificent. The same thing happened with this Premna that we repotted for Shofu, this guy. He kind of took a nap for a long time. And uh, so did the sea hibiscus that I told you about. That one that we repotted for Shofu also took almost a year off. So these trees, um, when we repot them, that is a bullet that we just gotta bite. You're gonna bite it either now or you're gonna bite it later. And so in a perfect world, yeah, I'd love to grow them in uh, bonsai soil. It's just harder. So you have to kind of find what works best for you. But the theory states you should be wanting to grow it in bonsai soil, just save you more headache. So this guy, I broke my own rule. This guy, I literally wanted to make a show in and I said, okay, well, I'm not gonna do the whole big pot thing. So I layered a cutting. I got really nice radial roots that I've been trying to control, but it's pretty unruly. And I've also been trying to build this as a sympodial style. Now, because I've got it double potted and not just in a bonsai pot, I'm getting a lot of very vigorous growth still. I'm still able to easily build branches. The tree hasn't slowed down. The tree's not uh, weak in any way. And it's still pushing coarse growth that I can build from, all right? Um, now, is it going to grow as fast as the one in the three gallon? No way. No way. But this is what I mean by you don't have to do everything I'm saying 100%. If you take 10% of it, it's going to elevate your bonsai. It's at least going to give you some tools to, um, to get through some plateaus. You know, you'll at least know why you're, where you're at. So that's all I'm trying to teach is just so you know where to, to apply this stuff. So this guy I've also done graphs on. He's got a graph to the back here. This is a graph. Um, so that's another thing that I thought was gonna be really, really hard to learn. Um, I always used to do uh, like approach graphs and graphs that you know I wasn't, I never had to separate the scion. And what I found was scion grafting, especially on things like sea hibiscus is, is pretty easy. And so that's a great way to also fill out and fix problems. So just filling up your tool bag. So that's a little sympodial growth pattern there where I don't know if you can see in there, but most of the, the divide in there, can you really determine which one's the, the thickest branch? They're all pretty much equal thickness. They're dividing their energy roughly equally. Um, and that's more of a sympodial growth pattern. So another sympodial tree, and then we'll get into the demo, is this little fella. 
So this is a nice little cluster of ficus microcarpa, tiger bark. Um, I took this off of another larger tree, and this has some great proportions, but look at the branch sizes and direction. And even if they are skinny, I'm gonna correct that. So my issue now, what I'm trying to do to get a good sympodial tree is to thicken this skinny branch, thicken this skinny branch, thicken this skinny branch, and get these little branches uh, to where they're kind of more even in, uh, in how they're divided, a little more even in the energy distribution, okay? So we have some questions. Sure. Uh, Terry would like to know, how long do you keep uh, wire on a tree? So well, that's, that's a great question, but that is one that can change drastically. So it, first of all, it, it de is determined by the type of tree. So a juniper is going to have wire on it a lot longer than a uh, sea hibiscus, okay? The next thing is going to be how fast and how healthy that tree is. So if a rain tree is really, really weak and you wire it and it's not growing, then you're going to get a long time out. It might stay on for a year if it, it never gets healthy. But if the tree starts growing, then you may only have a few months. So instead of thinking of this as a, a formula, as, okay, this is the amount of time where I gotta go get the wire off of it, start getting used to seeing the tree grow. If it grows, you need to get the wire off of it. If you go out to your tree and you wired it last month and it's got growth this long, the wire is gonna be cutting it, guaranteed. Even if it's a juniper, doesn't matter. If you've got growth out to here, you've now put, packed on some weight and now your wire's cutting it. So always kind of, look at it through the, the growth on the tree. Other than that, it's a good habit to just get into checking your wire. If, you, if you're not good at kind of seeing how it grows or you haven't gotten there yet, check the wire every month. You know, always go through your tree and double check it. Even when you're experienced, even I have wire cutting in uh, because it sneaks away, it gets away from you. You might check it one week and be like, oh, we're almost there. We're just about ready to take it off. And then you forget the following week. And then the following week after that. So. We're all human, and this stuff happens. Um, so if you forget it, it's not the end of the world. Just uh, make sure that you get it off the trunk first, your primary branch is second, and your secondaries, tertiaries are least important. So as long as you're keeping it off the trunk and the initial branches and you don't scar here, it's all great. You can fix it. Uh, Christopher says, uh, when do you go back to a single pot once you integrate the double pot method? And can you explain the process of separating the two pots? Sure, I go back and forth all the time. So um, I basically will stop double potting it when I no longer want the tree to grow strong. Okay, so again, we're, we're talking about our, when we first started this, uh, the Zoom meeting, I, I mentioned something about your two primary tools are weak growth, strong growth. If I want small leaves, is that, do I need weak growth for that or strong growth? I need weak growth. If I want big roots, do I need weak growth or strong growth? I need strong growth, okay? So knowing that anything that is small, diminutive, slow, requires weak growth. Anything big, fast, large, um, massive, that's gonna require strong growth. Um, so basically what I would do is, if I wanted to refine this further and get smaller and smaller leaves, I wouldn't double pot it anymore. I would start growing it slower. So people, I want everybody to understand that slow growing trees doesn't mean unhealthy. A weak growing tree is different than an unhealthy tree. A weak growing tree means that it's just not extending a foot in a week. It means that in three weeks you're getting this much growth. Now that's very, very useful when we reach the end of design and we want to work on very fine details, okay? So that's kind of what I'm getting at, is that if I wanted to then start reducing this leaf size, I need to start pulling out every tool that I have, which means don't let it grow coarse roots in another pot. I need to restrict its growth, okay? I need to pull back on my fertilizer, and I need to maybe feed with something that, instead of a, a 24 in nitrogen, I need to feed with a five in nitrogen. And I need to feed less often. And I need to repot less often. And that will start to kind of uh, dwarf the leaves more so. Okay, so the act of, of separating this is a little bit more difficult. Um, basically, you just pull it out, you cut the roots off, but then you do have to kind of supplement here usually. It's not the end of the world. I've literally cut the roots off of it and stuck it right back out in full sun, and you may have a few yellow leaves, but it's nothing critical. Um, I do like to do that every once a year or so because 
I don't like so many roots coming out the drain hole that it's occluding the drain hole in the primary pot, which this has probably gotten to that point because now when I water it just pools up in like a big swimming pool. So I probably need to go in and do that before we get close to winter so that I have a good amount of time to, to harden this off before then, okay? So um, I'll basically pull it out of there, just cut the roots, and then if I want to, I'll repot it in a double pot, or I'll just move on from this point and start refining it further, okay? So I hope that, hope that answers the question. Okay, do we have any others? Um, let's double check, but I think you've uh, answered them all. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay. All right, guys. So we're gonna go ahead and start doing the demo portion on this very, very large Kremna here. All right, I might even move it up closer so you guys can see some in-depth details. So I'm just gonna look at it real quick. Okay, so. The first thing, when I'm, if I'm just going out there and I'm shopping a new tree and I'm like, all right, I'm ready to, to get this guy going. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm ready to get this guy going, the first thing I need to do is obviously find my front. I need to know what branches to eliminate, what branches to not eliminate. So I've already kind of had enough time to determine which front I like, but so that you guys can kind of get in my mind's eye. One of the first things you want to do is kind of feel down at the soil and find that kind of buttressing root flare. All right, and you find where it flares out. And this one, it's going to be easy because it's flaring perfectly where we need it. But oftentimes, this is where you kind of have issues is we might have perfect branching here. You might say, oh, this tree's going to be great. And then you dig down and you notice that the nabari is perpendicular to where you wanted it. So you can just push forward and do that but I'll tell you that if you use that perpendicular nabari and you build with those branches down the road, you're probably gonna be disappointed because the tree's not gonna look very stable. Um, it's not gonna have that real ancient look to it and it's gonna be difficult to correct. So point being, we should largely dick, uh, pick our fronts based off the nabari. I'm not perfect either. I see good branch set up and I'm like, ah, oh, let's just do it. But you, you are more often than not gonna be benefited by picking your branches based off the nabari and not the other way around, okay? So this is kind of gonna be our front facing you guys, I believe, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I have to just remove things that I know I'm not gonna need, okay? I'm not even looking at what I wanna use. I'm not thinking about that. And I'm sure as heck not uh, thinking out here. Like flaws out here don't even matter. If there's a crossing branch right here, doesn't even matter because I'm fixing flaws here in towards the trunk. I don't, I'm, we're going through this whole development refinement phase. We don't care about the branches that have been pruned on here. We want to really build this out right. So I'm going to start looking for flaws near the trunk first. And what I'm looking for are branches on the inside of curves. I'm looking for too many branches growing from one point. So again, I Myself personally, I really like only two branches growing from one point. That includes the trunk. So that means the trunk and a branch, that's two. So I don't have the trunk and two branches. All right, that's three. So trunk and a branch, that's one. So I basically go through no bar branches, nothing growing right across, nothing on the inside of curves. And then I'm looking to create left, right, and back branches or right, left, back, but I'm looking to create branches that go around the front of the tree, okay? Kind of highlighting the front of the tree. And then I'm looking up here, I want as many branches as possible to build a nice, dense crown, if I can. But reality, most of that's gonna be cut off because the details that we need at the top of this tree are way smaller than what we have right now. So in reality, I'm not even worried about it, we're probably gonna cut all that back. So what today's program is, what I want you guys to really understand is oftentimes we go to demos and well, in a demo we want to teach you as much as we can. So we also want to put on a good show, make it entertaining for you guys. So a lot of times we're wiring the tree for the best look today. We're, we're wiring it so that it looks the best short term. Okay? We're styling that tree so that it looks the best short term. Now the downside to that is that oftentimes we're taking away the stuff that we need to make the tree better long term. Okay, so that's really where the divide is. 
There's nothing wrong with doing demos that way. It's just that in some scenarios, it's better if you plan it out and you leave things that maybe are ugly day one. Okay? So that, that's what we're going to do today. This is not going to be a beauty contest. We're not going to try and wire this out to make this a perfect bonsai today. We're going to wire this out, or rather cut it back and look at it, and then wire what we have to get this ready for the best tree possible in the future. Okay? So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and start digging in here. And if you guys want to launch some questions at Lindsay, that would be very much appreciated. So the first thing I'm taking off is this low kind of thick branch down here. It's too low to use as a branch really, especially on such a large tree. Um, on tree like, trees like Shohin, I will usually use a lot of low branches, even branches uh, exiting from soil level. But on a large tree like this, uh, I really do want to see ideally a third of the trunk. I want to see the nabari and a little bit of trunk before we get into branches, okay? So I'm just taking this out a little bit at a time. Okay. Now this is the real hard part. The easy part's making the cut. The hard part's getting the branches out of there once you've made the cut. And now all this stuff, here's an interesting fact, is for those who follow my Premna development online, and for those of you who, have, who like the Premnas I make, know that a majority of my Premnas are grown from parts. So a lot of times people are like, oh, you know, I, I want to go buy a Premna just like yours. And I have to explain to them, what I did was I went and I bought a Premna and I disassembled it into its parts. And I grew from those parts. So this is a part. I could technically make this, and let's make this into a sweet tree. Oh, this is actually going to be a good lesson right here. Okay. Catherine would like to know what happens to this tree after today's demo. It goes to my house for free. Show food paying for it, I think, <laughs> Mike said. No, um, it is going to be here available for purchase if anybody wants it. Uh, so just contact the nursery and, you know, you know the drill. It's all for sale. So if you'd like it, you can do that. So here's what I mean by parts, okay? This could be a great little show in, in no time, like literally no time. That's a cutting that's not too big to not root. Uh, this is something that I would maybe even root. It's got a nice large diameter that then goes to a smaller diameter here. We do have a big wound that we would have to heal, but for a part, that's great. Why not? You know, one of my most, uh, one of the premises that's getting a lot of exposure right now that I'm writing an article about uh, is built the same way. I basically took a piece like this out of the trash during one of Eric's classes and I said, oh, it's a neat looking premise piece and grew it that way. So a lot of times I buy these trees just for the parts. So and just, this initial clean-out isn't by any means the final, um, the final clean-out. I'm going to save my little part over here. I'm going to just clean out what I can easily see that I'm not going to be able to use, and then I'll go back and do a further clean-out for any like, serious flaws, and I'll kind of pick what I want to use. So right now I'm not even picking what I want. I'm only picking what can and cannot stay. So that'll make it easier for me to pick um, what I like, because I'll only have what I can have. Hope that makes sense. Terry okay. says, why are pull down in curves and branches? Pardon? Why are pull down in curves and branches? Why are pull down in curves and branches? Um, uh, if you could elaborate on that question a little bit, I'm not sure. Um, so pull down. I'm not sure, I'm not sure, Terry. Guy wire? A guy wire in the, um, is he asking to bring it down from the, yeah. yeah, see if you can elaborate a little bit, Terry, and I'll try and answer that for you. Okay. All right, so you see I've just taken this out, made a nice concave wound there. I'll go and I'll also probably get some cut paste when we finish and make sure that that's pasted so that that heals well, because we don't want to miss that opportunity. If we don't paste that, it's going to take a lot longer for that to heal. So we want to make sure that we get that done today. So these trees.
trees were field grown here in the nursery. Uh, that's why they're very, very large. But actually, uh, they grow much, much faster than you would think. So this is probably a five or six year old field grown tree, if I had to guess. It might be a little older, but I have a feeling it's, it's not. Uh, not yet. So all I'm doing is, is removing stuff that I know I don't need and issues like stubs that maybe weren't cut back or died back and just getting this ready to kind of get it healed up, get branches growing where we need it. And then the last thing will be uh, wiring down what we can use today. growth too, like the straight up and down growth. If I can't really, that's all I really need to wire. I don't need too much of that. This guy, still, I'm not going to save a ton of that, so I'm probably going to cut him back to there at least. Get rid of that head thing. Hope everybody's staying safe out there. Um, Alan would like to see the front again? Sure, yeah. So the front will be right in here somewhere. So there's actually a nice little hollow uh, right there that's got good rollover on each side that I actually really like, that once I kind of get some of these branches down and out of the way, we'll be able to see that a lot better. I'm sorry, I have to turn it away from you guys so that I can cut, but I'll turn it back in just one second. is a, kind of a dream species for me and this is going to sound a little kind of corny but when I first got into bonsai we did not have primna uh, available in the United States at least not that, that I could find and um, when I first got into this I remember we were, were all kind of into these tropical books we'd read these Taiwanese artist books uh, by Min Lo and we were reading uh, Tropical Bonsai Gallery and so in that, they always showed these primas, they showed Pemphis, they showed Australian pine, they showed all the material that, that we like to work with here in the tropics. And they showed it to a level that I had never seen before. You know, I had never seen trees uh, that were that old, tropicals that were that old, tropicals that uh, were that gnarly and collective. And the trees that I kept coming back to over and over and over again were the primas. Every primer I saw, some had deadwood, incredible collected deadwood, and some were just these perfect little canopies. Um, and each one, I mean, they were just perfect. Each one just uh, really spoke to me. And so Eric, I believe it was 2010 or something like that, got a cutting from Pedro Morales on his trip back from Taiwan. And uh, Pedro had one that he was gonna be showing, I think in the National Showman Exhibition, and Eric took some cuttings. And a few years later, you know, we're all working on Premna Bonsai. So it really is kind of a, uh, an interesting story how this came to be. And it's one of those things where I never really thought I'd get to be working on this material. And now it's very, very common material. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so Terry, I believe, clarified. He said, um, some of my trees I pull down branches and pull for curves with wire. You can do that. Yeah, you can use guy wires. That's fine. Um, Troy says, uh, when you say Australian pine, do you mean the invasive stuff that grows all over the place here? Yeah, that's great bonsai material. So the, the issue, the reason why it's not popular is we can't sell them. So you can't, um, 
uh, you can put a lot of work and effort into it and it'll just be for you. But they're amazing, amazing bonsai. And uh, in other countries, they're highly, highly revered for bonsai. So that's something that if you can get a good one, you can definitely make a, an incredible tree out of that. So now we gotta get this panel over to my house for about 18 months, right? <laughs> trying to eliminate anything that doesn't cross or anything that crosses the trunk. So you see we've got kind of a big trident here. One, two, three. One, two, three. This one's definitely gone. The one in the middle. Then this pair here, this one crossing the trunk, I don't love. And so I'm going to look at it and I'm going to deal with it. But I don't have to deal with that now. I'm going to take the middle because again, what are we doing right now? We're just taking away what we know we can't use. And then the iffy stuff, we come back and we look when the tree's more cleaned out. Okay? I'm gonna continue on and just take out the for sure stuff. But this is why when I first started teaching, you know, this was eight, nine years ago. Well, maybe not that long. Probably about eight years ago. When I first started teaching, um, it was really hard for me to see a, a design in every person's tree. I mean, I wasn't incredibly experienced, you know, I knew what I knew, and I was a decent enough artist, but I didn't know it. Um, I didn't know everything. I still don't know everything, but what I would do is kind of defer to this uh, system. If I got somebody's tree and I was like, God, I don't know, what, I don't even see anything in that tree. I would just first kind of take a deep breath, stop getting nervous, and I would just start removing everything I knew couldn't be on the design. That's it, that's all I would do. And what I noticed was all of a sudden, all started becoming clear, and I was left with only stuff that I could use. And then I just picked away from that and said, oh, that's too much, that's too little. And then I was really, could make a tree that way. So even if your eye's not trained uh, to see it right away, if you just follow those rules and eliminate potential flaws, you'll kind of be on the right track. So we've got another, this is good for them to see, Lindsay. So you see this cluster above our little dual fork. We've got this dual fork here, but then we've got this cluster here of one, two, three, four, I think it's like six branches. I need to thin that down to one, okay? Bare minimum, you could leave two and it will look better today, but just from my experience, you're gonna go back next year and just eliminate it down to one anyway. So for the sake of efficiency, one branch. So now I'm gonna get in there and I'm gonna cut it and then I'll show you guys when I finish. But what I'm deciding, and I'll explain why I made this choice and not the other way. Okay. So I took out the branch going this way. Okay. And the reason I did that is that the branch emerges from the trunk on the right side, your, the viewer's left side. So it emerges on this side of the trunk which means I don't want to keep the side that then crosses the trunk over to the left side, the viewer's right side. Um, I want to keep the side that stays true to where the branch emerges from, okay? So I like to think of it like this. I will allow some cheating. So if I have a back branch and I need, to, I need a branch slightly over from it, I'll give you like a 90 degree window from where that branch emerges. So you kind of get a 180 arc where you can move that, but you can't loop it all the way back, okay? You can't go more than 180. Then it looks unnatural. So you're kind of given this, this wave that you can go from wherever the branch emerges. All right? And I gotta clean that up because it's a pretty ugly little wound. So that's what that's going to look like. Got that cleaned up. That's it before paste. 
And now note, I'm just working my way up the tree. I've already looked at these guys. And again, I'm not looking at any of the growth out here because none of it matters. It really doesn't matter. When I buy a tree, the growth that's on it, I, I don't, it doesn't even register with me. I don't even think of it. So don't ignore it. Just you're buying the trunk and the bones. Just when you go shop your next tree, just remember you're buying bones. That's it. Unless it's a finished tree, I should say that. Let me, again, let me preface that. But if it's a finished tree, that's different. But when you're going to build a tree and you want to make your own bonsai, you should buy the one with the best bones. Don't get tricked into buying the prettiest of them. Okay. So then I'm going to come over here. So I am going to, I am going to finally take this guy off, I think, the left hand side. I just can't deal with it anymore. It's Good. Now we can see into the trunk. That's good, right? So we're making some headway. We can see in there now. Now we are going to have a big wound that we're going to have to deal with. And now this is one of those things where you have to ask yourself whether it's worth it to deal with it. Um, I have a tree that's similar to this that. Um, I basically have a similar size wound and I chose to carve it instead. Now, I don't necessarily think that's the best choice, uh, me personally. I carved it and what I honestly feel that was, was a way to not have to spend the time healing that wound. That's what that was. So in a way, it was a shortcut. And in an art like bonsai, anytime you take a shortcut, just think of it like this. Anytime you're taking a shortcut, you're losing quality. Anytime. So, this is an art where it's not about shortcuts, it's about the long game. Everything's about the long game. So, um, at least by the Japanese standards. So, you know, there's new movements in bonsai and that's whatever, but talking about just the Japanese mindset of it is that that should be healed unless there was some interesting deadwood. And there's some people who will say, well, just carve it, you know, make it interesting, make it hollow, and you can do that, and that's fine. Uh, but the argument will also be that there wasn't anything interesting here to the get-go. It's just a, a young, relatively young, six, seven-year-old tree that was chopped, and then we would be carving that young wood that really has how much grain? How much grain, how much density? It's only six, seven years old. We're gonna then carve that wood uh, that's not natural to try and look like something that it isn't. Uh, it, it's just not physiologically sound, okay? Now, if we had a really cool piece of dead wood that had a lot of movement, a lot of grain, a lot of twists, um, that's a different story. That's interesting. That's worth keeping on the tree. But this, to me, not healing that, to me, just feels like rushing to refinement. Okay? That's, that's my take on it. Is I look at that wound when I see a tree that has that, and I think, you know, that was kind of rushed, and that could have been healed a little better. So, this is going to be a, a hefty undertaking to heal that, and I'm not saying it's not. So in order to heal this wound, you will now have to grow a branch, probably this big. And then you'll have to make a wound on that branch, and then heal that branch. So it's not something that's going to be done quickly, and this is what I mean by you have to kind of pick how much of this you're going to apply. Like, what path do you want to take? Do you want the tree to be a 10-year project? Because if you don't, then ignore some of this stuff. You know, this is just kind of working you guys towards the highest level that you can work. Okay? So... So that's something that, uh, for the sake of the demo, I'm not going to do it now, but this is something that I should take a saw and find the live edge, which is probably down by this branch, and I should clean this to that other branch, okay? Make sure there's no dead wood in between where the live lip is, because otherwise it's never going to heal appropriately, and we're wasting time, because if I don't correct this here to here, then as these branches grow and thicken, they're not going to be closing any wound because they've got all this wood. Okay, so they're not going to roll over it anytime soon. It's never going to happen. It'll just roll around it. So um, we should, before we get too far ahead, go in and cut another little sliver that just takes a little pie piece off of there that just connects those two live branches. Okay, so that we're healing well.
Alright, so now we're going to get up to the top. Alright, and this looks like kind of like a mess in here. Alright, this will show the big mess. Okay, so Lindsay, if you can get your camera right in there. So you see we've got about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight branches growing from one plant. So that's definitely going to be reverse taper issues down the road. So I've got to thin that down to two, two branches, okay? So the way I like to build them out is, and I'm going to draw this out so you guys can really see that. When I'm building branches, I try to V them out pretty far, okay? I don't want to position my branches, here, I'll show you this a little bit here, like that, okay? So I position these branches pretty far apart. I don't want them close together because then you'll get no branching here. So if I position these right next to each other, I'll get no branching in here, and I'll end up with just one side of the branches on each side. Plus, it's just not as efficient. So if I spread these out as like at 10 and two or whatnot, then I'm basically setting myself up to cover the most surface area because as they divide, if I continue on that divide process, 10 and two, okay? Look at how, just by dividing one more time, I just double, double my surface area. Let's do it again. Now, the branches are almost touching. Okay, so you see how that, that continually building that out by spacing them at 10 and 2, that gives you a wider surface area to divide branches. Okay, so don't group them so tight. And this is the problem is that it looks better day one if they're grouped tight. And this is what I mean by the short game versus the long game, is it does look better. If you keep them all tight and compressed and you wire all your branches together in a nice pad, it looks great. Uh, but it's not as good for the long game, okay? So it's, that's another one of those things where now I wire them out a little further apart and allow more room for the ramification to fill that area in, okay? So it also helps me fill in the tree quicker as a whole. Um, sure. Catherine says recipro re reciprocating saw, we want to see you use it. Oh. Um, Alan agrees, make the cut. All right, well, then I got to get the saw. Um, Alright, so I'll go get the saw. You guys hang tight. Okay, I'm gonna just try and this is a tricky one. So you see that was all dead wood. 
You know, it's not alive. When you see that kind of setup like that, it's not going to be alive. And it, if it's been a long time where that stub has sat dead, uh, it's only going to be alive in between the two branches. So that's the way that internodes work, is that even if it's green for a little while, after a year or two, that's going to die back and it's only going to be alive where the two branches meet. So uh, I'm going to continue to chisel that down. All right, we have a, Chris, a question from Christopher. Um, it's a two-parter. So he says, after you wire a branch, in which direction do you make your first bend and why? So that's largely dependent. That, that's a, a big question, um, but I like it. So that's largely dependent on the tree and, and the, the way that it's facing. So usually um, I try to make my first curve, I guess, away from the viewers if that makes sense. And it's not always the same. Um, but if I'm really thinking about it more often than not, I kind of have it curved that way first. So it's usually curving away from the viewer first. But realistically, if you want to know my approach, when I'm really doing heavy wire uh, uh, designs, designs where I'm really twisting them up, is I wire them with heavy wire and I twist in the direction of the wire. So whatever I wired it in, if I wired it in a clockwise direction, then I have to twist that branch in a clockwise direction. Otherwise, we'll just unwrap the wire or it won't hold as well. So that theory still comes into play even on small twists. So even if I'm not doing a full corkscrew, I still need to kind of twist the wire in the direction that I wire it. So as you up elevate your bonsai game, it does matter how you apply the wire, whether you wrap it this way or the other way. So once you've wired a tree, this is a good example, I'll pick them up again. Once I wire a tree like this, I'm now set forever uh, or I, I shouldn't say this isn't a hard rule, but in my book, I'm set forever in that I now need to wire it that direction every time. I don't cross the direction next time to avoid wire scars. I make sure that all my twists are now consistent because if I have a twist going uh, uh, clockwise and then all of a sudden my next secondary branch goes counterclockwise, well now that leads an inconsistency in the design, okay? So once you kind of set the wire up with your primary branches, that kind of does indicate how you need to wire your secondary and tertiaries and so on, okay? So that's upper level stuff. That's a great question, but there's a lot, a lot to that. Um, good, good question. So one of the reasons that that sawzall thing was so easy, surprisingly easy, um, was that this wood is already dead. So it's very, very soft. It was actually just kind of uh, turning to powder. And you can actually see, I can just scrape it away with my finger. So it's very, very soft in there. Oh, look, you don't even need a concave cutter. <laughs> so uh, that shows you that it's very, very soft. So there's that live edge there. You can see if Lindsay gets in a little close, you can see that I nipped it. It's a little green there. So that's our live edge. And I can probably even see a little more if I take my little straight razor. So you see there's some more of that edge there. So you see that's kind of where we want to stop. We want to stop when we can see that edge. And so again, we're right on that edge here. You see we're hitting a little bit of green there. So an X-Acto knife is a great tool to have for cleaning wounds, um, as well as grafting. Okay, so now let's deal with this tuck. Okay. So again, I talk about spacing my branches at 10 and 2. So this leads me to my next thing. Since I use bifurcation now, a lot of bifurcation, and that's kind of how I build trees, I don't look at apex as a sim single branch anymore. So people are always like, oh, what's my apex? And I used to just say, okay, it's the highest branch of the tree. But really now, that's an apex for me. That whole assemblage is an apex for me. So my apex is te technically that whole structure where at the top it goes from one to two, two to four, four to eight, and it rounds out by that increasing division, okay? 
it gives me more of a fanning look other than a consistently layered look, okay? So that's kind of how I've been building these more and more in recent years. And so that is important to have my branches at 10 and 2. So that's kind of the setup for that guy. And I'm going to cut him even further. Okay, so this is what I mean by where the work is going to get very, very real. Because I'm literally going to prep this the same way I would at home. So I'm not going to keep anything that I would not keep at home. I'm not going to wire out branches that I don't normally wire out at home. So this is the part I was telling you guys about where now I walk through and I kind of see um, what I have left to use that I like, and I kind of go through and clean up what I can. So the reason why I started getting very, very aggressive on Premna is because, as you guys have seen, is we can accomplish a lot of growth in a single grow season. So I'm not worried that this isn't a 900-year-old pine where you know the growth, we're never going to get it back if we cut it off. We can literally rebuild the structure of the tree in one season. Not a problem. So I'm not worried about cutting off skinny branches. I get more worried about removing large branches. That's the stuff that I got to worry about because it takes much more time to fix and grow back. So. Marty Rosen is still hanging on. Hey, Marty. Thank you. I see the only one. Oh, no, we have uh, 19 others. All right. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks for hanging out. So you see, and if I'm being honest with you guys, the most important stuff that I like to wire down is the stuff that's low on the design. Because that also makes sense physiologically. Okay, so think of old branches on trees. At the, the, the lowest part of the trunk, it's going to be the oldest part, and that's what's going to be kind of weighing down and getting lower and lower and lower. Uh, the highest part of the tree is the youngest part of the tree, so that's where growth is still young and supple. Okay? Cheat you. Still going to be very much how I would do this. This is what I'm cutting off. Okay, this is why it doesn't matter. As you see this kind of stuff, 
is we just grow better because this is what I would have to do to clean that out and work with it anyway and I still already have a big knob at the base. So it's better to just kind of cut back to a clean section, regrow good branches, and really only trying to save kind of the bulk of the branch, the big part. Um, Elizabeth says, on a different subject, can you discuss plate cutting grafting uh, when you have a tree overlapping roots? Plate. Hope this makes sense. Plate cutting, uh, in parentheses, grafting. Oh, root, root grafting maybe, she's talking about? So plate cutting, all plate cutting is, and that can only be done on certain trees, is plate cutting just means you are literally taking a saw and cutting every root. So there's no feeder roots left on the tree. So that's plate cutting, is where you're basically cutting it back to the stubs of the nabari and also plating it on the bottom. So it's completely flat on the bottom. So uh, plate cutting is risky for all but like ficus trees. Um, Troy would like to know what tools are you using brand? Just curious. Oh, Connection. So Connection is what we carry here at Weigert's. Um, and that is the brand that I have adopted. Uh, I am very happy with them. I think they're great tools. Um, and I definitely would recommend them. If I could say though, don't, me personally, I'm not a big fan of the stainless tools of any brand. I just, uh, I've gone back and forth, I've tried them all, at least stainless and carbon, and I really like the carbon steel better. Uh, I went through my phase with stainless, and it's basically just lower maintenance with uh, rust, that's it. So the edge doesn't hold as well, they're not as strong of tools, and overall, I, I just think they're not as, as good, so. Janet says, nice job, Mike, as always. Oh, thank you, Janet. Thanks for watching. Uh, Catherine says, ooh, you just cut a large part of the bottom most branch. Was that not useful to quickly thicken the first branch? <laughs> bottom most branch? I don't even know what I just cut off. Um, if she's talking about this portion, yes, but I want to make sure. So half of this game is not just on thickening. It's where you're thickening and how you're thickening. So that's what I mean by... Development is not just putting something in the ground and forgetting about it. Development, oftentimes, I have to go out when I'm developing and I have to make sure that the branch I wire is the one that the plant is putting energy into. And it didn't just, let's say, when I walk away a week from there, push another sucker next to it and the wired branch stays weak and now I've got a, a straight sucker that I didn't deal with. So I've still got my low branches here that are gonna push out. I see what she's saying. I prune these back for bifurcation. So she is absolutely right. I could have maybe left those a little longer, but it's gonna push out again anyway, and I'm just gonna run one uh, from there. So I'm not super worried about that. Um, the brand of the tools you're using again, please. Kanishin, K-A-N-E-S-H-I-N. All right, Christopher says, you mentioned you like to see about a third of the trunk before your first branch. But those bottom branches are only a couple inches off the soil. So that would be um, ideally, ideally. So, and also that's, that's called the rule of threes. So we do, uh, more often than not, it's, let, me, let me rephrase that, let me backtrack. It is easier to make a successful tree following those rules. So if you have a tree and you're like, I don't know how to make this look pretty, it's not gonna make it easier by leaving low branches, okay? I think that this tree, without the low branches, um, especially at this stage, would be a wash. We basically have very little useful to us. So I do still think that we could use these on this tree. Would it be better if this was here? Absolutely. Absolutely. But bonsai is a game of compromise. And so trying to work the most with what we have and still fit the most in that rule of what we're looking for. So. If you follow those rules, your chances of making a good tree are a lot, lot better, but it doesn't mean that great trees aren't made all the time from breaking the rules. Oh, okay, so guys, I'm gonna continue wrapping up, uh, just doing some wire on this guy. Really not much more to see, I'm just gonna be laying some stuff horizontal. Uh, we'll probably post some pictures afterwards. 
but I know Mike and them got a long drive back. They got to get to bed. I know Lindsay's got to get to bed. And then don't forget yours truly. I also got to work in the morning. So uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in and being as patient as you could with me. Hope you guys enjoyed the program. Thanks for all your questions. Follow us on Instagram. Follow us on YouTube. And uh, stop in when you get a chance. Otherwise, have a great night. Uh, last question. What do you use for scars? Cut paste. So real easy. Orange or gray tubs. You can use the uh, plumber's putty, whatever. But just get a Japanese cut paste and you'll be in good shape. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Sweet.